Stuart Rose, as you know, is a business legend. He has many fans, including Jonathan Gunthry, who is the city editor at the Financial Times, who earlier this year said about the new chairman of Ocado that he is, and I quote, the Sultan of Swoon, Mr. Entertainment, and a business heartthrob. <laughs> you can't get much better than that. Stuart Rose grew up in Tanzania, um, in Africa. He then went to a boarding school in Yorkshire, but he started his career in 1971, really, where he became a management trainee over at Marks & Spencer. He then rose his way through the organization, excuse the pun on the word rose, um, it'll get better, I promise, and he then, in 1989, uh, after he then joined the Burton Group, despite doing very well at Marks and Spencer's, he decided to leave, which was quite a risk at the time. After the demerger of the Burton Group in 1997, he became the CEO of Argos. One year later, he became the CEO of Booker Group, where he began a great turnaround there and oversaw the merger with Iceland. But it was the, in the year 2000 that his magic really kicked in, when he became the CEO of Arcadia Group. At the time, Arcadia had debts of over 200 million pounds, and just two years later, he turned that company around and it sold to Sir Philip Green for 855 million. He himself made 25 million pounds out of that deal. In 2004, he became the CEO of Marks & Spencer's, which, as you know, in the retail world, is about as rock and roll as you can get. He was brought in for two main reasons. Number one, to turn around the profits back to uh, a healthy level and also to fend off against Sir Philip Green. He did both things absolutely beautifully. He held off Sir Philip Green with his bid uh, to try and buy Mark Spencer's and turn the company private with his Goldman Sachs bankers and a valuation of around 13 billion. And he also increased the profitability of Mark Spencer's so much so that in May of 2008, the profits for the company were posted at that rather sweet number and milestone of one billion pounds net profit. He was knighted for her services in 2008, and he's currently obviously the chairman of Blue Ink. He's the chairman of Fat Face, as well as the chairman of Ocado. The day that it was announced that he was going to become the chairman of Ocado, the Ocado stock went up by 6%. It's been going up ever since. So I'd like to ask you all to give a massive round of applause and welcome to the stage, Sir Stuart Rose. It's like hearing your obituary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> At least you get to hear it before you go. But <laughs> I've got a feeling there'll be a lot more after this. Um, so Stuart, we like to start with what Stop we... calling me sir. That's the first I thing. Right? I can't get after that. Call me Stuart. Nobody calls me sir, apart from people in restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I went to boarding school like yourself. I can't get out of it. I'll try to. Stuart. <laughs> we normally like to start with what we call a quick fire round, just to get to know some of our leaders and our guests on more of a personal level. So quick questions, quick answers. Um, so a tough one to start with. You're involved in uh, lots of companies, and so I know that you work hard, but what do you like to do for fun, and it can't be work? Well, let's just take the work thing first, because people often ask me why I'm still working, and the answer is, well, you know, if, you, if, if you're reasonably fit and active, and you get up in the morning, you've had a cup of coffee, and you've read the papers, what do you do? <laughs> I mean, there's a limit to how many horses you can bet on, how much food you can eat, how much you can drink, and how many girls you should chase. So uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, no you know, that's why I go to work. Because it's fun and we're all going to live longer than we thought by at least 25 years and the government says we can never afford to retire and our pensions will never come. So trust me guys, you better find a job you're enjoying and keep at it. <laughs> no, it, it, it is important. I mean, we'll talk about some serious things in a minute, but you know, my son, uh, who's uh, just 30, lives in Australia, uh, has just left uh, banking after 10 years and he hasn't got a job to go to. And uh, it's quite a big decision he's made, but at the end of the day, he's not enjoying banking anymore. And I said to him, if you're going to work for the next 30 years, find something you do want to do. Yeah. He's made the right decision. Absolutely. Because then you're more inclined to work hard, and that's what it takes yeah. as well. You've got to have fun. Fun is not a dirty word. Stuart, right. Um, I saw you in the Woolsey um, 
a while ago, and I was tempted to come up to you and say hello. And uh, I said to myself, don't do that. Give the man some peace. Do you generally, and, and famous people like yourself, do you like people coming up to you and say, will you sign my Marks and Spencer scarf? Or do you like to be left in peace a little bit? Uh, listen, I mean, I, I mean you know, I, in terms of celebrity, you know, there are people who are up there, and there are people down here. I'm about there. It's just that <laughs> some, that people do, some people do come up to me from time to time. I had a wonderful one in the park the other day. A bloke came up to me and said, you're him, aren't you? I said, pardon, sir. He said, you're, you're him. You're him. You're that bloke. I said, well, perhaps you could be more specific, sir. Anyway, he went on and on and on and on and on. And then shouted at me about a whole pile of things I knew nothing about. And then he turned around and he says, yeah, I've got it now. You're the chief executive of uh, Waitrose, aren't you? I, said, I actually said, no, sir. I'm unemployed and went off on my walk. Stuart, you're chairman of Ocado, um, talking about waitress, as you just mentioned, and um, you know, you're chairman of Ocado, which works closely with Morrisons and also with Waitrose, yet you're also in love, I think, with Marks and Spencers still. So do you do a weekly shop, and if so, where? Uh... Well, <laughs> let's just take the Ocado. There's very so many subjects there, and there's so many things I could talk about. First of all, there's some <laughs> Ocado colleagues here this afternoon. Can you put your hands up, because I don't know you all. Well, good afternoon. Nice to see you. Uh, number one, uh, I wasn't an, an Ocado customer until a few weeks ago for obvious <laughs> reasons. Um, yeah. But you know, if you live on your own, as I do, and you don't eat in that often, there's a limit to how many deliveries you can have Ocado a week. I mean, I think even even uh, Tim and, uh, and Jason will get slightly pissed off if I only order a can of Coke once a week. But having said that, um, how can I miss an advertising opportunity? I've got a cottage in Suffolk, which I've just refurbished after some time. I've just got it back. And I had a delivery there two weeks ago, and I have to say to you, even though they probably knew it was me, that the guy said he'd come between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. He arrived at 5-2, saying, texting me, saying he was five minutes early. Could he come? Did he have 100% of everything I wanted? Yes. Did he bring it into my kitchen? Yes. Did he take all the arse ache out of me having to go shopping? Yes. Would I use it again? Yes. Is it a brilliant service? Yes. So there we are. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. Tim and Jason and the team who work there are the most... Um, dedicated team of people I've seen, and you know, if you ask me a different question, which is why I joined Ocado, um, uh, to slightly paraphrase the previous chairman, Lord Grade, I didn't realise until I became chairman of Ocado that I was the eighth choice. But that's because, <laughs> that's because nobody else wanted to do it. But you know, in life, and some of you may be in, in innovative businesses, some of you may be doing startups, some of you may be not d decided yet what you want to do, but the fact of the matter is disruptors and Ocado is a disruptor, are exciting places to work in. You know, this is a business that's still got the proof, you know, proof, it's nearly got proof of concept, but it's exciting, and I like being involved with people who are called contrarian. Mm. Tim is a contrarian. Businesses that are disruptive, Ocado is a disruptive business, so that's fun. Where do I yeah. shop? I go to Marks and Spencer. Obviously, they still give me a discount, which is very sweet of them. Um, <laughs> so, the cheapest food in town for me, including Ocado. Um, and I eat out a lot, so, <laughs> although I do like cooking. Just so we all know, this is the last quick fire round question, but just so for where we get there, what was it like being knighted by the Queen? Um, well, first of all, I mean, you know, I'm not being falsely modest. I didn't expect it. I was actually, it was very, it was a slightly funny story anyway. I was in America on business and I came back, I think it was about the 1st or 2nd of December. Must have been, what, 2008 now. Uh, and I, as I landed at Heathrow, my phone was for the 27 messages, and there was one from a woman saying, Mr. Rose, could you give me a ring? It's urgent or something. So when I rang the woman up and they said uh, whatever it was, uh, I said, well, it's Stuart Rose, you called me. And they said, yes, Mr. Rose, uh, did you get our letter? I said, well, that's quite difficult. You know, could you give me a clue what it's about? She said, well, I can't tell you it's confidential. I said, well, this is going to be a short conversation. <laughs> you wrote me a letter. I'm not sure if I've got it. If I did, I don't know what it's about. So how can I tell you if I've got it? Anyway, she eventually said, well, we sent you a letter a few weeks ago saying that we're minded to, to, to give you an honour and you haven't replied. I said, well, I'll be honest, I've never had the letter. I said, where did you send it? She said, I sent it to number 20 Evelyn Gardens. I said, well, that's very interesting. I said, I'll leave it number 67. So, so <laughs> it's obviously a very happy man or a woman down the road. Um, but it was very nice to get honoured. It's a bit, you know, it's really a reflection of the people that you work with. And, you know, m and the time I was there, you've got 100,000 people, you can't do all the work and somebody has to get the... Uh, Somebody has to get the recognition. I got it. And uh, to answer the question, she was very charming. She said, so you're the man from Marks and Spencer. I'm not sure what she said. I suppose say she'd say the same to the man from Ocado, wouldn't she? <laughs> Um, so Stuart, you, uh, let's talk about your youth. It's interesting to know that uh, you, know, you did grow up in Tanzania. How did that come about? My father was a, uh, I, listen, I'm a quite an interesting example of what makes this country great. Uh, you know, I'm an immigrant second generation immigrant. My father came here from uh, China in the 1938 <coughs> of Russian parentage. Uh, he, his parents were, were homeless. He came here and made a life for himself, joined the RAF, fought during the war, became a middle ranking civil servant. And after the war uh, and after he'd um, 
started his family, he decided it's very tough to make a living in the UK, saw an advert to go and join the British colonial civil service, running half of Africa in a car, and yeah. off he went. Um, you know, just example, if somebody opens the door for you and you can't see a man trap on the other side, it's worth a go, and that's what he did, and yeah. I, I just had to follow on, I was, you know, three. <laughs> Great experience because, you know, you learn very early on about living in a different culture and just in the same way when I was younger, my children lived with me in Paris and just in the same way now my son lives in, in Australia. You know, it's, we live now in a, in mm. a truly, truly global world and mm. uh, the more experience we all get about foreign cultures and about the, the glo globality of the world, the, the, the better place it's going to be, so it's good stuff. Do you think, you know, you mentioned the changing culture, Do you, you're a very smart guy but you've also got a massive drive to win. Do you think that determination came some, playing a bit of pop, pop psychology, do you think it came somewhere from your youth? Well, the answer is, I mean, as you say, it's very sweet of you, I've got a massive power to win. Actually, I haven't got a massive power to win and I don't care if I lose a, a monopoly. Right. So actually, I always say to myself, if I had a real, real massive power to win, I'd have been a lot more successful. What I have got is a massive fear of losing. Right. Uh, and that's probably what's driven me. That I was, you know, my mum wanted me to be a doctor. Mm. I didn't want to be a doctor. I found a reason not to be a doctor. I couldn't find a job. M&S offered me a job. I was so pleased to get the job, I stuck at it. And I didn't have people say to me, oh, did you plan to be chairman of Marks and Spencer? Well, of course I didn't. You know, I actually planned to keep the job I had for as long as I had it. Yeah. And then I did that job quite well. And somebody said, well, would you like another job? So it was completely serendipitous. It was completely done on the basis that you should only plan your life as far ahead as you can see it. Uh, and it was mostly driven by fear. And if I hadn't been driven by so much fear, I'd have left mm. the business earlier because, you know, I stayed 17 years at Marks and Spencer. I'd learned all I was ever going to learn in the first 10. Yeah. So I probably would have been, you know, successful like Sir Philip Green. Yeah. <laughs> It's a joke, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because maybe that, that fear of failure could actually be more powerful than the, than the, um, the yeah, design I, of winning. I, for many people, and I, I, listen, I obviously know a lot of people and I've seen a lot of people and I've, you know, when you lead a business, you see what drives people and what doesn't drive other people. Fear is a very driving factor, but it's not a bad mm -hmm. thing because it's, and many of us do our best work and you'll probably recognize that in yourselves when you're under pressure. You can surprise yourself when you're under a hell of a lot of pressure and you've got a deadline and it's got to be done by today and it's got to be done. Your work quality and your work level and your capacity goes up. Yeah. When we've got nothing to do, we get lazy. We're basically yeah. indolent animals. Yeah. It's interesting, I've got a friend of mine who, uh, who's very, very insecure and so he's driven by that yeah. insecurity and uh, he ended up going for counseling and he got counseling and as a result, he's cured as insecurity, Death, but now he doesn't, he can't be bothered to go and get a job. I mean, he's just got nothing to prove to anyone. Yeah, we don't want too many of those around, do we? No. Uh, <laughs> trying to cut down social security costs. <laughs> you started in 1971 in Marks and Spencer's. Is there anything, is anyone or anything that you were particularly inspired by back in 1971, those early years? Well, listen, I was very lucky. I mean, M&S is still quite a difficult company to get into. It's, you know, I think it interviews six or seven thousand people a year for about 200 places. Mm. Uh, I wasn't a graduate. Uh, I, I possibly had a bit of the gift of the gab, uh, but I blagged my way in and obviously when I got in there I was quite lucky to get in. Uh, mm. And um, the company was at the top of its, uh, you know, the, uh, of the pinnacle at the time. It had had uninterrupted profits for, for nearly a hundred years. It was held up as being the beacon of uh, the best of British. And I learned, I had a thoroughly good training, it had some thoroughly good people, uh, and you know, it was a lucky start for me. Yeah. Was there any habit that you did pick up, that, or any advice that you got given in your early years that has stayed? Well, one bit, I mean, it's the bit I've sort of touched on a little bit, isn't that is that, you know, don't, I meet a lot of people, and I used to, you know, when I was leading whatever business I was leading, I used to say to people when their annual appraised, a lot of people would come for an interview or whatever else, what do you want to do? And you know, you get two things, I, I want to be a chief executive, I want to be the boss, I want to make a lot of money. And I looked at them at side as well, first of all, why do you want to be the chief executive? You know, how do you know you're going to like it? It's actually, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Yeah. You know, it's quite stressful. Yeah. It's quite lonely, right? And anyway, there's only one of those in every company, so it's quite mm. difficult to get there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, beware what you wish for. And the other thing is people say to me they want to make a lot of money. My mantra is a bit different, and that is, you know, why Philip Green teases me about the fact that he's rich and I'm not. But, and that is that you shouldn't chase money, in my view. You should aim to do as good a job as you can in whatever profession you've chosen to do. And if you do that well, money will follow you. Right? If you go out and just say to yourself, I want to make a lot of money, very, 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 very few people actually achieve that aim. And most of them are dead unhappy. Yeah. Right? 
Mm. If you just ch chase the money, it's like a dog going around in uh, a circle. It just chases its tail the whole time. So just do what you can do, do the best of your ability, and you'll make a living. Mm -hmm. And anyway, there's a hell of a lot of really good jobs out there in middle management, in senior management, in companies. So in m and for instance, you know, there are 50 different professions. You can be a food technologist, you can be a textile technologist, you can be a buyer, you can be an IT specialist, you can be a distribution specialist, you can be any damn thing you want. Mm -hmm. They're all well-paid jobs, they all have good terms and conditions, they all allow you to have a good work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Being a chief executive has a shared work-life balance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so trust me. <laughs> because a lot of people think I'm not going to become, try and become the CEO or not trying to get to the top because they automatically think that to get there you do have to lose the life out of the life work-life balance equation. Is that always do you think? No, there are, like everything in life, there are sacrifices, of course. There yeah, are. yeah. I mean, but you know, in my particular case, I didn't aspire to be a chief executive genuinely. I never crossed my mind that I could till I was about my mid-thirties. Kays and I would look around and think to my son, myself that my boss wasn't that good. But if he wasn't that good and I wasn't that bad, why couldn't I do his job? Yeah. That was about as ambitious as I was. Yeah. I certainly had no ambition when I left M&S um, in 19, whenever it was, 89, that I would ever reappear there 15 years later. If anybody planned that, it'd be a genius. <laughs> it happened. Yeah. And I went to four jobs in the middle. So, you know, that was just serendipity. Yeah. Could I have done the job after, before, had I not had the experience in the interim? No. Yeah. And it was a blessing in disguise that I decided to leave one day because I learnt more in the first three years after I left Marks and Spencer that I did in the preceding seven or eight that I stayed there. On, on that you point, Sister, you, unlike, for example, potentially Sir Terry Lee here at Tesco, you have moved around quite a bit in your career. And I've noticed also you've moved when things are going very well for you. So would you say that that is good advice for us on well, the way well, up? The latter bit, obviously, timing's everything. If you can get good timing, good luck to you. That's, you know, Mark <laughs> Carney will be a, you know, living proof of that. Yeah. Uh, he's just arrived <laughs> at the Bank of England. Things look pretty good, or better. Yeah. Um, when I left m and in whenever I left at 89, my father took me aside uh, and he said to me, you sure you're doing the right thing? You're working for a good company. You're in the pension scheme. You see, <laughs> you've got a steady job. You know, why are you leaving? I didn't really know why I was leaving. Just decided I wanted to go. I didn't believe all the propaganda. And uh, these days, of course, it's different. You need to get a good grounding. So my advice to people, when I used to talk to the graduate trainees, which I used to do every year at m and when they came in twice a year, I used to say to them, look, guys, there's 200 of you roughly in this room. In a year's time, 100 of you won't be here. That's partly because we won't like some of you, you won't like us, so you'll be some natural, there'll be some natural uh, selection. At the following year, there'll be probably only 50 left out of the 200, and out of that lot, we'll only like about 20 of you. And if you're any good, my advice to you is pick up some good skills, um, stay w close to us, but if you want to go out afterwards and get some other experience, we'll keep tabs on you, you keep tabs on us, and you can always come back. Yeah. Because now we do live in a global world, we do live in a fast-moving world, it is important to go and get different experiences. And I said, you know, in my own case, I could never have done... I hadn't sacked anybody mm. when I left M&S in 1989. I'd never recruited anybody. I'd never taken on a rental in a shop. I'd never closed the shop. I'd never seen a balance sheet. I couldn't understand... I mean, you know, I barely understood what cash flow was. Mm. When I went to work for Ralph Halpin, Sir Ralph Halpin as he is now, and he came and asked me a whole part of questions in the first three days I was there, I was terrified. I didn't know the answer to any of them. But I'll soon learn. No, but it's not a bad thing to move. I mean, you know, you've got to, in, in life, if you're, I mean, what do you need in life? I mean, you, you know, for, we could just, we're going to get completely off track here. If you really want to get on in life, in my view, you need to be warm and breathing. Now, you might say, well, that's obvious. But it, well, by warm and breathing, I mean you need to have something about you. That doesn't mean charisma. It doesn't mean some amazingly tw tw brain twice the size of anybody else's. It just means a sort of belief, self-belief, that you know, you, you've got something to offer, which is my point, that if you can't find a willing people, people who you fit in with and people that understand that thinking of yours and a culture that's similar to yours in the organisation that you're in, go to a different place. Because right. at some point, you will find that you are a square peg in a square hole, not a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, on the other hand, really enjoying what you're doing, Stick at it. So there's no hard and fast rule. You've got to follow your instincts, follow your gut. Has that always, in, in terms of decision making, has that been your driving way of making decisions? Or do, if you talk from, like, for example, John Moulton from Better Capital, he say, he'll say ideally he wouldn't make any decision by gut. It would all be mathematically calculated. Now, listen, John is a very successful man. I don't believe him, actually. I'm sure he does make some gut things sometimes because we're all, we're all animals. You know, we've got this vestigial sort of instincts and you know who hasn't sat 
at some point in our life and been f f frightened of something or felt the hairs on the back of your neck, you know, st creeping up or something. We've all got these residual sort of feelings, and you should listen to them. You know, it's like you know, if something doesn't feel right and it doesn't look right and it doesn't sound right, there's something wrong with it. Yeah. So, you know, logic is really important. <laughs> Disciplined education is really important. Assessing all the facts is really important. But at the end of the day, make a decision. Mm. And it's a bit like my 90% rule, which is, you know, if it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, trust me, it's a duck, right? If you spend the time catching it, buying a net, catching the duck, sending it off for DNA testing, by the time you have the answer back that it was a duck, the bloody thing's flown away. So, you know, you have to make a decision. <laughs> yeah. And that is partly leadership. Leadership yeah. isn't about always being right. Yeah. Leadership is actually more, quite often, about actually... Uh, um, getting enough people behind you mm. to actually agree that you're going to move in a certain direction. Because mm. you, at some point, you're all going to make a mistake. I've made loads of mistakes. The next best thing you've got to remember is if you're a leader, is to say, OK, I was going to go this direction. You all agreed with me. Actually, we're now going the wrong direction. Do you agree we're going the wrong direction? Yes, shall we now go in a different direction? But doing nothing is not an option. Standing around mm. milling about is why companies go nowhere. Mm. You've got to be active. Better, keep to have, moving. better to have a decision than no decision at yeah. all, isn't it? You mentioned the word charisma in there, and John Guthrie, who called you a business heartthrob, um, clearly thinks you're charismatic. And charisma, would you say that it is essential? I mean, it has been a great tool for you to be as charismatic. Or do you think it's overrated and it's just about getting the results at the end of the day, however you do that? Well, you know, charisma is a big way. Somebody rang me up about, talk, I think it was the BBC the other day, talking about the sort of cult of leadership. And, you know, that mm. Mark Carney's come in and he's a name in the Bank of England now. And that, you know, we used to have Terry Lee here and we've got people like this. I, I, that sure I tightly described that. I think that comes afterwards. What you have to have is you have to have people who are running businesses who are confident. The problem is there's a very fine dividing line between confidence and arrogance. So that's a difficult one you've got to get right. You know, I can appear mm -hmm. confident. I don't want to appear arrogant. But so you've got to you've got to judge that one. That's something you've got to sort of self learn. Mm -hmm. By definition, though, if you appear confident, you're going to be more confident than most other people. So then people sort of start labelling you as charismatic and whatever else. Mm -hmm. It's about though inspiring people. Yeah. It's about trying to sell your vision. It's about, as I said, getting a collective behind you of people saying, do you think this is the right plan? Mm -hmm. You know, if you put 10 people together in a, in a primary school and say, you know, we're going to make a daisy chain, somebody will emerge as the leader. That's what happens. It's like what's what the army does when the army does selection. They put these 10 blokes together and say, we've got 20 logs and we've got to get them across there without getting our feet wet. You know, somebody comes up with a bright idea. Yeah. I don't think that's charismatic. I just think that is some people have got more are more, uh, are more predisposed to leadership than others. Yeah, yeah. But it's not a bad thing not to be a leader. It's actually quite nice being a follower. It's quite nice if you're going out for a walk and somebody's got the map and somebody's got the compass and all you have to do is think about the next pint. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, you know, thinking about, I want to go in the right direction, it's quite tiring. More and more people uh, sell books on leadership every year. You've talked about uh, some of the attributes of, of great leaders. But just to reiterate that, so as you said, they've got to be smart, they've got to be somewhat decisive, uh, or at least make a decision if it doesn't come to that naturally. Is there any other characteristics that you think that you look for, for example, when you're looking for great leaders that are going to stand out from the crowd and really, as you say, inspire and get well, people to follow? So, so, so two questions there. First of all, my, my father taught me a um, technique in interviewing, which I still use, rather embarrassingly, but you know, it served me well. And that is, if you want to be a brain surgeon, clearly you need to have a degree in brain surgery, or clearly if you want to be an atomic physicist, it's quite handy to know, you know what happens when you mix this and that together. But if you want to go into general management, then you know, there are other things you look for. And one of the first things that uh, my father said to me that his interview technique uh, most of his life was he used to look at people to see if their hair was clean, to see if their shoes were clean, and to see if their fingernails were clean when they came for an interview. And if they didn't pass any of those three tests, he didn't bother asking many other questions. They didn't get the job. I have actually asked, uh, I've added one more, and, and I say, well, but, and do they look me in the eye? Mm. Because that says a lot about people. If they bothered to smarten themselves up, if they bothered actually to care about their appearance, if they actually look as if they're engaging with you, which is why I use the phrase warm and breathing, that's how you have to judge people. Because leadership is about judging people about whether they fit in the team. You know, Ocado has got a particular culture. There's a particular type of person who enjoys that sort of place. Yeah. Ditto Marks and Spencer, ditto, I'm sure, Waitrose, ditto, I'm sure, Tesco, and whatever else. And therefore, part of the job of the leaders is to, sit, to choose people who might fit into that organisation. The second thing is you don't want all the geniuses because you'd have a revolution. <laughs> They'd all kill each other, you know? You want people who are do horses for courses who can do the bit. So part of your job is building that team. So yeah. there's no sort of hard and fast rule about you know, bringing in only the best. 
and therefore what is it, you know, what are the right sort of people? You need a good mix of people. You need thinkers, you need doers. You need people who are sort of geeks, and you need people who are generalists. You need people who are sort of followers, you need people who are leavers, and it's getting that balance right which is the most important thing. When it comes to the end of this little bit, I'll get, you know, you talk about a management book, I've got a management book, and it's got my little ten tips on management, there you are. That's, that's it. So it's not going to run to a book, is it? Yeah, um, <laughs> but, but we'll talk about it at the end. We do have publishers in the room, so they, you'll be surprised what I think we might be able to turn that short, into if you... It'll be a short book, a short conversation. Um, We've also got, by the way, uh, BBC and BBC production companies as well. And uh, Martha Lane Fox said that you should have been on TV. Is that something you want to do in the future? Sorry, we're going off subject. But it's you have to be careful when somebody tries to sell you something like that. What is the reason you might be doing it for? And if it's anything, you know, most people would say when they say, "Do you want to be on TV?" Oh, yes, please. But actually, it's probably driven by ego. Well, mm. that's the wrong reason. Yeah. You know, then I, without being falsely modest, I thought if I write a book, who'd want to buy it? So, you know, it, it, you don't, don't do it because mm. it's sexy to do. It's a bit like, you know, it's, follow your own instincts, follow your yeah. own thoughts, follow your own beliefs, you know? Yeah. Whilst, if, if it's okay with you, can we just have a quick pro say of those ten, because I know I'll probably forget. So, ju ju just you the really top hear points. This, this is really dull, right? All I do is sometimes when I'm just talking to Pete about, uh, this is my little he headlines, and this is not in order of go, but it served me pretty well. Enjoy work, because you're going to do it for a long time. You know, as I said earlier, you know, most of us are going to have 35 years at work. If you're not enjoying it, sit yourself down at the weekend and say, I am not enjoying this. Now, that does not mean you can't have a bad time at work from time to time because you're having a shitty time with your boss or because you're under a particular amount of pressure or because the business isn't performing or you're not quite sure how you're going to get this contract landed. That's different. That's what I call day-to-day -day sort of stuff. I'm talking about if you're fundamentally not happy with your thing, move on because you've got to you know, be, enjoy it. Second thing is be flexible. My point earlier about going through a door when somebody opens it. I've always gone through doors when somebody opens them for me. And yes, I've looked through the other side and seen a man trap. Probably good advice if you see a man trap, don't go through. But, you know, try it. What's the worst thing that can happen? You didn't like it. Go somewhere else. Take a risk. If you don't take a risk, there's no reward. So that goes back to that point about overanalysis, paralysis. At the end of the day, if you want to have a no-risk life, trust me, you shouldn't be in business. Right? Yeah. In fact, there's no such thing as a no-risk life. Guts versus brains. We just had this conversation, yeah. right? Brains are important, but guts are very important, so don't forget that. Back yourself. You know, nobody else is going to back it. Very few of us are <coughs> going to find somebody who picks us up in life and says, Stuart Rose is going to be a genius and I'm going to back him. That's rubbish. You read that in books. It's not true. Right? So you just have to back yourself. The speed and certainty rule, the 90% rule, I told you about the duck. Keep it simple. That is the one about the bigger the business, the more need there is to keep it simple. You know, business is a very simple thing. You've only got effectively three lines, haven't you? You've got a revenue line, you've got a cost line, and you've got a margin. Can't change anything else. So just remember that. that we, we, we wrap it all up in books. We wrap it all up in, 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 in sort of theses about this and the management tomes. At the end of the day, you're in business, right? If you're not earning any revenue, you can't make any margin, and you certainly won't make a profit. Yeah? Stop doing it. Right? Believe in yourself, as I said, and stick to your guns, but be aware of two things. Be aware of the law of unintended mm. consequences because, you know, I always say to people that 50% of your life is not what you plan. It's what some other bugger does, right? So I could have got up this morning and said I'm going to go and talk to Anthony, but I could have been run over by a bus driver. It's what he did to me, right? So, you know, you can never have plans. That's why you have to be flexible. No plan there should be no such thing as a plan that can't survive some amendment. It has to be that. Um, expect the unexpected. Very important. Don't be afraid of changing your mind. You know, if you, if you haven't been wrong, frankly, you're not trying hard enough. I had a boss years and years and years ago who said to me, Stuart, if you don't make a mistake once, you're not doing your job properly. He said, my advice to you, this was the, dead, this was the dangerous bit, he said, my advice to you is don't make the same mistake twice, which is pretty good advice. Thank God I didn't. Um, um, Confidence versus arrogance, I've touched on that one. Um, and then there's the whole thing, which is that awful <coughs> phrase, which is now coming into the fore. Uh, and as I said, these aren't in order. Corporate social responsibility. You know, people start yawning when you mention that. But it, it's not about that. It is about sustainability. And we live in a world today where if you don't take any notes of sustainability, you're lost. And at the end of the day, we live in a world where we're using resources twice as fast as they've been created. We live in a world where there's going to be twice as many people living as there are now. We live in a world where there's going to be 30% more food needed, 30% more energy needed, and 30% more water needed by 2030. 2030, guys. 
right? That's only 17 years away. And if you're a child born of parents today in Western society, you are probably going to live 100 years. So, you know, for 70 years, those people are going to, well, for 83 years, those people are going to be short of water. So be, be aware of that. Um, teamwork, you can't do it on your own, very important. Leadership is lonely. Remember what I said to you, everybody thinks it's being fun being a chief executive. Of course it's fun. Of course there are plus sides. Of course you get paid reasonably well. But it is very lonely. And the reason I mention it is because you should build around you a team of people that you love and trust outside the business, preferably. In fact, I would say exclusively outside the business that you can take for a beer and say, look, am I being a complete dickhead? <coughs> and get the right answer. Not no, Stuart, you know, the emperor's got his clothes on. Because people always tell you all the time, yes, Stuart, you're absolutely right. Until you fell over. So you've got them there, not necessarily family, because the trouble with family is they love you, so they'll lie to you as well, right? <laughs> you, you've got to have people out there say, Stuart, I think you're being a complete, you know, lo you're completely loopy about this. If I were you, I wouldn't do it, and trust what they say to you. Um, take time out. It's a holiday thing I mentioned earlier. I used to have a boss who's still alive. I um, don't know why I mentioned that, but he is. Um, <laughs> he, maybe that's a good re Maybe the reason he's still alive is because of the advice he gave me, um, which is about keeping KF time, keep free time. And he used to say to me, Stuart, I advise you, I'm, frank, I'm telling you, that in your diary once a week, you should try and put in KF time, which is keep free time, which is if you don't come to work and you go and sit in a park bench or you go and sit in Hyde Park and you think about life for a couple of hours, I'm not going to think you're slacking. Mm. Now, clearly, we're all under huge pressure, and I've never taken that advice all the time, and I've often thought, silly ass, how did he manage to do that? But I have and have had, and a lot of people I know do have, their best ideas and solutions to problems when they're not really straining at the problem. They're sitting there a bit more relaxed, and suddenly it comes in left field or out five field, something I'm not going to do. Because your brain relaxes. When your brain relaxes, it's much more productive. So just think about it. Keep free. Um, the importance of money. What I mean by the importance of money, and we've touched on this one as well, is the unimportance of money. Don't chase the money. If you're any good, the money will chase you. It's not going to be any dip. That's the most important thing about it is. And the last one is having fun, which we've talked about. So if you then boil it down to a little bit of sort of, you know, that's it, fellas. The book's written. Um, you know, what do you need in life? Now, you may say, well, it's all right for you because you've been reasonably successful, you know, blah, 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 blah. But the reality, the reality of the fact is there's not many benefits about getting older. One is you become a little bit more thoughtful about life. And I've tried to give this advice to my son and say, look, get your work-life balance right. What do you need in life? And this is, again, a little list. It's not in order. You need good food. It's my list. Good wine. Clean sheets. Hot water. A roof over your head. Your health. And if you're lucky, someone to love you. That's it. You don't need two cars. You don't need three houses. You don't need a bigger job than the bloke next door. You just need to actually be enjoying what you're on this planet for. Now, you may say, well, that's fine for you, but trust me, it's not a bad thing to sit back on a glass of whiskey or wine or water or whatever you drink at the end of the week and think about it sometimes. <clears throat> So Stuart, that was brilliant. Can we stop being philosophical, mate? That was, no, it was beautiful. What advice, just bring it down to a very practical level, there was a, there was a report on, uh, done the 77 percent of people think they've chosen the wrong career, right? And so they're going to work and they're sitting in their jobs thinking, I am feeling uninspired. I don't have a particularly charismatic or, or you know, boss or company that's got a compelling vision. But they're working because they've got financial requirements. Uh, what would they, what? Everybody has financial pressures, and I understand that. And you know, we've had a very difficult recession. And for those people who've lost their jobs, it's terribly tough. But you know, mm. I don't know what the statistic is. If you say 77% of the people are unhappy at work, I say 99% of them do bugger all about it. Yeah. Right? Do something about it. Yeah. Do you know we've got less social mobility in the UK now than we've said since Victorian times? Do you know how people now, in a research recently, don't want to go more than 15 miles from home? Because they don't want to be away from their mothers, they don't want to be away from their dads, mostly they don't want to be away from their friends or their girlfriends, they don't want to be away from where their football team is. It's ludicrous. It's the 21st century, for God's sake. Mm. Right? Mm. And That's ironically, true. the digital age has actually made us more sort of immobile than mobile. Because yeah. we don't need to go anywhere, because we can do it all on the iPad. But get out there, go and see the world, go and travel, move about. It would be interesting to see what the, uh, the correlation between technology and weight gain is. Um, <laughs> but, but, so Stuart, if we can, just last point on leadership, and then we'll go on to the organizational excellence and success then. But um, leading in a downturn, it is a bit of a boring subject because of the fact that we've been in it for such a long time, and you once said at the IOD annual convention that people are fed up of being fed up. So, um, but yeah, a lot of CEOs have put the focus on 
cuts, 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 and not enough on creating an inspiring vision as well. Um, in fact, Machiavelli, who said that make no small plans because they have no, no power to stir the soul. So what advice would you, gonna, would you give to a CEO or leader in these downturns? Well, when we have, listen, I've lived through four or five recessions. There's no doubt about it. This has been the longest and the toughest, mm. and it's been the first one that's been a truly global recession. And, and it took us quite largely by surprise. You were quite sweet to point out that in 2008, M&S made a billion, and 15, a billion and 15 million profit. Following year, it made 787. Mm. Now, could I have done something about reducing that profit drop a bit, but not much, because behaviorally, people just said, I don't need a pair of shoes. Mm. I won't buy a suit this year. I won't do that. It's very, very tough. So, there were, you know, I'm slightly sympathetic for the chief executives who had to do what they had to do, which was protect the business, get the balance sheets back in order, keep the costs under control to make sure that they actually preserve the viability of the business. And that's all good and proper stuff. The more important bit is the second bit, if you like, which is, yes, has it gone on too long? And have we become risk averse in the, in, in, around the world, but in the UK particularly, about expansion? Uh, and what is the, the driver for this? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. Let's talk about that risk quotient for a second because it's directly linked, I think, to innovation, right? So more and more companies are sort of, um, as you said, they have that fear of innovation, but yet so, because it's, it's risk and people are worried about losing their jobs. So how do you create that culture where risk taking is acceptable? Well, there are some very good examples of, uh, of, of innovation going up. You go around the UK, I do. A lot of what I do now is below the radar screen. I'm involved in quite a number of other companies which are privately held startups. I mean, I'm involved in one startup which is taking eight million pound a year, one startup which is taking two and a half million pound a year, one startup which is taking 800,000 pound a year. Between them, they're collectively employing about 80 people, but two years ago, they were employing about eight. Mm. Right? Well, that's great. There are more startups in the UK now happening than have happened in the preceding 10 years on an average monthly basis. And you know, so that all out of this recession has come some good news. Yeah. A sort of, if you've lost your job, needs must. If you don't like the job you're doing, people are being more thoughtful about, well, if I don't really like this, and actually, this is not what it cr cracked up to be, I'll go and try my own thing. People are trying their own thing, and there's no shame now in failing. So, you know, I met mm -hmm. a girl yesterday, a woman, who is a professor of um, plastic surgery at Bristol University. She does some work with me. And she was saying, oh, my son's left his highly paid job. And I said, well, what's he doing? She said, he set up a business doing uh, bespoke bicycles. I said, well, what's the matter with that? She said, well, he's, you know, had a good earnings and he had a good this and had a good that. I said, well, has he sold any bikes yet? She said, he sold seven bikes in the first five days. I said, well, that's not all bad, is it? <laughs> and, and if he doesn't succeed, he can always go back to doing what he was doing before. But I think it's great that actually now, because we've had adversity and because we've had people having to think differently about their lives and what turns them on and what they can do and what their company's done to them, so they can go out and be entrepreneurial. Mm. That's going to be the difference between us being successful and in this country as a, as, a, as a PLC, UK PLC, and being unsuccessful. So still, I wish I was 30 years younger, I'd go and do it. Talking about that, you've obviously spent a lot of your time in corporate world, and now recently you've had exposure to smaller companies by being chairman of boards. Is it a different animal between a very successful corporate director and an entrepreneurial yeah. figure who's going to... Yeah, listen, I, I, mean, I genuinely say this now. I wish I'd had the balls. Yeah to have backed myself after learning for five years the basics of business and gone and done some entrepreneurial stuff. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What is the worst thing that can happen to you? You fail. I'll start again. But I used to, I've used that mantra ironically in business all my life to say to people in management, OK, well, if you really believe in what you want to do, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? And I say, you get sacked. Well, you get sacked, get another job. Mm. You know, there is, there is plenty of opportunity out there, but most of it you can create yourself. So Stuart, if we can talk now just about turnaround companies bef before we hand over to uh, the floor. But turnaround, you have had your turnarounds in your time. You've been very successful at that. Some people are coined as turnaround CEOs. Others you know, sort of become a turnaround CEO or leader by accident because their company is not doing particularly well. Um, what advice do you, would you give to a company in the room or outside that is pointing south and they need to redirect the ship to get back up again. So the fundamentals, if you like, well, of a, of a The first thing is don't get to a situation where you have to be turned around. Mm. But that's entirely within your own control, by and large, because you know what tends to happen is companies go through cycles. They all start doing better. They all start believing their own PR. 
They all start, therefore, saying, well, this has been really hard, but it's all fantastic, isn't it? They all start actually f losing focus of what the day-to-day -day is, and they all wake up the following week, or the following morning, or the following month, and find the world's passed them by. That's what happens. It doesn't matter whether you're Marks and Spencer. Look at Tesco's. Anybody from Tesco here? Yes, there we are. I mean, a great business, and obviously, you know, I've, I've long said that Tesco is a great business, but they've got a shitty time, mm. right? Everybody thought they were invincible. Everybody thought they could take their 33 or whatever it is percent market share to 40 percent market share. Everybody thought they were going to conquer California. Everybody thought it was amazing. Well, I have to tell you, without being clever, you know, I used to go to some Tesco in Melbourne High Street and thought, if I if I come in here again, you know, this place is falling down. It ought to be, ought to be shut down by the by the by the health and safety people, because they didn't invest in the core UK business, mm. and the service element wasn't very good. And, you know, that's what management are now tackling, and I think they've done a really good job. But, you know, they, all businesses have accidents. Mm. So you have to keep constantly aware. And the, the mantra is in the, in the global world today, you've got to have every single antennae that you've got, every sort of piece of information and, and intelligence coming into you all the time. You've got to know that we live in a 24-hour real-time world. You've got to know that if David Beckham goes to a party tonight in... I don't know, Los Angeles and wears a white tie, somebody will come in to Marks and Spencer tomorrow and say, have you any white ties? Because you'll have seen him on YouTube or they'll have seen him on social media or they'll have seen him on the TV or they'll have seen him in OK mm. Magazine next week. Right? That's what happens. Equally, so we live in that. So you have to be aware of all those trends. Music trends, film trends, fashion trends, food trends. Look how we now live in the UK. We've got the most dynamic food industry in the world. The freshest and the most dynamic and the most innovative, right? People go off to Turkey, they want Turkish food. Mm. People go off somewhere, they want this food. They want us to produce it, right? So you've got to know what... It's, it's understanding what people want just a little bit ahead of when they want it. How do you do that? It's, a lot of it is, well, by having the right intelligence coming in, but also trusting your judgment and having good people around to do that and just spot it. And it's, mm. if you're half a step ahead of your customers, you're about right. If you're a full step ahead of the customers, you're too far ahead. And if you're in line with what your customers are thinking, you're a loser. Mm. So the, that's what good, successful companies do. You got to, and then you're going to find that seam, and when you find it, you've got to keep mining it. But remember, the mine is not inexhaustible, so then you've got to find another mine. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what good management does, and that's not chief executives. It's about putting together a good management team who've got that sort of, you know, that sort of yeah. constant you know, ability to reinvent. You know, we'll see what happens with Apple. Yeah. You know, Apple's been through a very interesting time because, you know, they lost their chief executive, they've got a new chief executive, they've got some, you know, they've got market share beyond belief. Yeah. Can they keep it up? But Mr. Samsung is not sitting on his ass, is he? <laughs> yeah. So, Stuart, talking about if we can, Tesco there, you just mentioned, I mean, a lot of people think that the reason why uh, m and I mean, m and is doing well, but you could argue it's not having the growth spurt that potentially you would have wanted at the time you left. Tesco certainly, uh, with its US division closing down and fresh and, fresh and easy, uh, you could argue that it's, it's certainly profits are down by almost a half. Some people think it's because Sir Stewart's not running that ship or Sir Terry's not running Tesco. Now, to what extent is that true? Well, it's not true, but you can't, I can't avoid uh, having some responsibility for what took place on my watch. Mm. I like to think, I would say this because I'm running my own PR, um, that I tried to catch up for the decade of underinvestment that M&S went through between 1994 and 2004 when the business squeezed the capex spending to the extent that we had stores that Tesco had recently where the, under, you know, the air conditioning was not working, the asbestos was still around there, the escalators were sort of rotting, mm. the floors needed doing, the lighting wasn't very good and the stores looked shit. Well, you can't do that if you're in the shop business because people want to go to a decent environment. So, I, you know, we accelerated that, 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 that thing, but it take, there's a lag time. Yeah. Now, I've never commented on M&S's performance since I've left. They've lost some market share in clothing in the last year or two. Is that self-inflicted? Is it a market issue? Is it fixable? Da, da, da. Time will tell. Do I think the brand is in better nick than it used to be? Yes. Do I think that you know, your mantra to yourself ought to be, I'd like to leave the business in better shape than I inherited it mm. for the next person? That's what you should try and do. But you know, no, no business is sort of invulnerable from attack. And no business is, you know, it's not just Terry Leahy or indeed mm. when I was at m and it's about the right team. Stuart, you mentioned there about um, picking on trends, 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 and picking up on an early trend is very important. But the, the key disruptive innovations um, that companies can identify, would you say that that is 
you can rely on your customers to do that, or do you no, realistically? You've got, no, the customers will tell you if you're on the right track. I mean, yeah. a good example is Ocado. You know, yeah. that, that's a disruptor, but it's not yeah. proven case yet. It's not making any money, right? Well, not making enough money. You know, what is the biggest? What is the biggest change? Instrument of change in the world, this thing. You know, mm. this thing. Now, I used. I was until recently chairman of a company called Mobile Money Network, which is a secure, uh, a secure bank grade platform which allows you to transfer money anywhere, any place with security. You know, if you go to Africa, they never had bricks and mortar banks. You can see a Maasai tribesman standing in the middle of the Kenyan bush transferring money from New York to Mombasa. And he believes what the balance says on the piece of the thing on the front. I can't remember the exact number. My Ocado <laughs> colleagues will tell me at the back. 25% at least of Ocado's orders now come off some sort of tablet or, or, or mobile phone. We were the first retailer to put a mobile phone mm. app in, which allows you up till whatever time tonight, 9 o'clock, to change your Ocado order for a delivery tomorrow morning. You yeah. can do that on the bus or on the train or on there. Is that cool or not cool? Is that what people want? I remember when we introduced an app at Marks and Spencer to buy stuff and people said we were bonkers. Well, they do a lot of trade on them now. Yeah. So, you know, this is what dictates. And customer will tell you if they like it or they don't like it. And this is what's going to happen. We'll all be walking around soon because we're busy. You know, on a Saturday morning, instead of me having to sit home and watch the Lions having a tough match in Sydney, I'll be able to go and do something else or so watch it on my yeah. it's live streaming on my watch. At the same time as tell the time, change the card of order, and make a date with my girlfriend. <laughs> Google devices. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe we can interview you on the watch. Interview you on the watch here. You wouldn't have to be here. And um, so that is a trend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But but it's got to be smart management at top that pick that out, not the customer. Basically. Well, you've it? got to back what you believe. It's it's spotting. It, it, if you, look, it is about spotting the trend, and it's yeah. about going for it. But you know, there might be ten things you spot. What you should do is be able to chase all ten of them. Yeah not bet the ranch on each of them, That's knowing that actually only two or three might go somewhere. And if the other, if one of them does go somewhere, that one will pay for the other nine that didn't go Absolutely. anywhere. So, but it's, you know, you can't not do anything. Yeah. It's like the you vent- can't believe you've arrived. You haven't arrived. The only place I guarantee you've arrived is when you've died at mm. the crematorium. Mm. You've arrived, mm. right? But there's no afterwards. <laughs> So Stuart, uh, Ocado, um, last few questions and then I'm handing over to you in about two minutes time because I know there'll be lots of questions. Ocado, some people love it, some people th- think the business model is fundamentally flawed. As you said, it's not making that much money at the moment. Why did you become chairman of Ocado? And that, did that freak you out knowing the fact that you were eighth and seven others didn't want it? <laughs> well, I think I've given an answer. I mean, the answer is I don't believe it's a question of if. I don't believe it's a question of who. I believe it's a question of when. Yeah. If, do I believe if that people want this sort of service? Yes, I believe they do. Because even though we've just had the world's worst recession, even though there are some people who are dispossessed in our society, even though there are some people who have lost their jobs, actually most of us are time poor but cash rich. Yeah. We will pay for getting rid of inconvenience. So it provides a convenience and there's enough people there to supply that. The, the who is who can provide that service. Well, we are undoubtedly the best... Pr- you know, the, the best deliverer of that service. We are the yeah. only people who can deliver a can of baked beans within an hourly time slot to a designated postcode without losing our shirts, right? Mm. And that is quite amazing, right? Therefore, it's only a question of it, uh, when. When is this going to happen? And the answer is quicker than you think. There's already indications of it because, you know, we've seen that, that it's beginning to do that. And, you know, this whole issue, some of you may have read, some of you may not have read, we haven't actually done... Uh, officially our deal with Morrison's yet, but we will do it because we have an extraordinary general meeting on the 18th of July. But the fact of the matter is, you know, Waitrose apparently got upset about whether we would be doing business with somebody else. They should be pleased, actually, in a funny sort of way, because what it's done is raise the profile of home delivery. Actually, you couldn't have chosen a customer who's more different in terms of customer profile. The overlap between a Morrison's customer and a Waitrose customer is about there to there. The overlap between a Waitrose customer and a Marks and Spencer customer is there and there. So, you know, it's, it's conveniently part. Sure. Actually, you'll never know if you're the Morrison's website because Morrison's will have Morrison's product delivered in a Morrison's van with the Morrison's livery and that's it. Mm. And the Ocado will still provide what Ocado does with its own brands and through the Waitrose ranges. And if you've never seen the two, all you won't know is they come from the same warehouse. So there's no breach of contract. It's actually, we should be able to live side by side. But what it will do is raise the profile of home delivery. Yeah. And you've seen all the brouhaha today. Why do you think in today's FT, Philip Green is banging on about rates being too high? Because he's woken up the fact that he hasn't got any way out and he's got lots of shots. The Morrison's deal, did you think, I mean, is it like chess in your mind? Like, 
immediately after he became chairman of Ocade, or shortly after the Morrison deal announced, it went through the roof. You, did you see that as an opportunity no, before you became no, no, chairman? No, no. First of all, let's, let's, let's put, give credit where credit's due. I had nothing to do with it in the sense that I am the chairman. Clearly, I knew the deal was in, 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 in conversation. Yeah. This is a deal that's been put together after much thinking, much talking, and much negotiation by Tim and the team, and it is a team operation, and that's something which is a continuing development of this business. I just happen to be chairman of it, right? Yeah, we, you know, it's about your point about is timing important? Yes, it's better to come into a card when the share price is 65p than when the share price was three quid, right? The question is now, can we make it go from three quid anywhere else? Mm. But that'll be down to how good our goods and services are and how well we deliver them, and I'm confident we will. Mm. Some people think that you're just going to sell to Amazon reasonably soon, is that? <laughs> I see you, Tim made the comment yesterday, read today's paper. So Stuart, you, you mentioned right at the beginning about this not being your obituary. You didn't say, you said, don't, he said, don't read too long at an introduction because I don't want it to sound like my obituary. Um, but in terms of going forward, this is my final question. What are some of the things that you do want to do? You've got, you're not going to be short of opportunities. Uh, I mean, you know, I am very lucky. I've had some success. I'm involved in quite a number of businesses. I get genuinely more pleasure now from the sorts of businesses I'm involved in than latterly I did running a big corporation. Right. I haven't reappeared as a chairman of a sort of big company because it sort of doesn't quite do it for me. I've been a chairman, I've been a chief executive, and you know, there's a lot of our sake. I can go into, you know, I'm involved with a company called Dressipe. There's two girls and three or four other people sitting there trying to help women, you know, get a better mm -hmm. deal on their fashion or get a better understanding of what's, fashion, what's available in fashion on the high street. That's a little startup. We're mm -hmm. raising half a million quid. You know, we're spending 20 grand a week. If we spend it and we run out of the money, we're going to go kaput. So that's a lot of hard thinking. I'm involved in Ocada, which is a bigger business. I'm involved in, in Blue Ink, which is a little private retail business. These are, these are fun. These are helping mm -hmm. management teams with some of the thinking. But I don't run the businesses. Right. I sort of am around if they want to pick up the phone. I'm there. They say, Stuart, what do you think of this? And, you know, I'm very, it's very nice. I can give advice, but they don't have to take it. And I'm not always right. Uh, and I learn a lot myself. And I've learned as much. And that's the other, I suppose, the most important thing to finish on is actually you've got to keep learning. And you've got to mm. keep open minding because, you know, when you get up in the morning, as I said earlier, and you've read the paper, you, you, it's a bit sad to think you've done it all. Yeah. Keep working, have fun. What do you do if your instinct says it's this way as chairman, but your CEO's instinct says it's that way? I would say to the chief executive, if that were you, if I were you, I wouldn't do that, but I would never interfere if they yeah. come back to me and say, we, as long as they've listened, mm. as long as they've thought about it, as long as they've come back and said, for the following reasons we've thought about this and we actually don't think that we, will, we want to continue down the road, I would back them. It's the job of a chairman to back the chief executive. You know what the chairman yeah. does? He hires the chief executive and he fires the chief executive. He doesn't interfere in the middle. So Stuart, thank you for that. They're all still awake anyway, that's the end. Hey, they are, I know, I can't see one that's nodded off, that's fantastic. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, questions, we've got two microphones. If you could just please uh, say your name and the company you're calling, uh, calling from, sorry, uh, <laughs> where you're from, that would be fantastic. That's your other job, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Marion Neal from BGO. Uh, you talked about disruptive organisations and challenger brands. I'm interested in what your advice is for smaller firms who are trying to compete with larger organisations on service and quality where we can't compete on cost and margin. Well, I mean, I think you've answered your own question. I mean, for me, it's about uh, value. And for me, the qu value for money is a function of price times quality. And, and I think we do live in a world today. I mean, clearly we've seen the, the rise over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years of the discounters. And, you know, there are those people who have to go to the discounters or choose to shop from those people. But actually, there is a lot of people doing well at the, there are a lot of people doing well at the moment who are offering value, value for money. The price times the innovation, <coughs> time, times the, uh, the, the quality, times the service, and you can do it. So differentiate yourself in a different way. You're not immune from price. So by that I mean the obvious thing, that if you're twice as expensive, clearly you need to worry about your price as well. But if you're talking about a differential, which is what I call a manageable differential, up to 10% difference, but you can then sing about the, the, uh, the other factors and the other, the, the other added values, then do so. And that's what you should do. You know, when we were trying, I mean, they've actually stopped doing it now, Steve, but when we tried to break into um, electronics at Marks and Spencer, TVs and whatever else, we actually had a very good business and they've shut it for sort of semi-political reasons. But if you were trying to compete with the price of a TV from Comet, you were never going to win. 
what m and were one of the first to do is to say, right, well, the TV comes, it will be put in by somebody, they won't leave until it's been done, it will come with an automatic five-year guarantee, uh, and, and that's it. So, and, and, you know, that's nice because the m and consumer who tends to be a little bit more mature wants the security of knowing that if the damn thing doesn't work, there is somebody they can ring up, that somebody will turn up, will come and fix it, and the shop is not going to be shut the following week. So that's a way of differentiating yourself. Differentiating yourself. Harriet Rich from Brands to Life. Um, how do you cope with the kind of the media scrutiny that becomes more personal as when you're starting off as a leader and it's new and suddenly I think there's been so much uh, an increase of linking the personal with the professional? It's, it's difficult and, you know, it's becoming more prevalent in business today. Um, I mean, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to understand a bit like, you know, people sometimes forget, politicians in particular and others, that at the end of the day, with the job goes the responsibility. So, you know, without saying that I was any good at it, I used to behave at m and knowing that, or always assuming that I was being watched. And a lot of the time, you had a photographer chasing you around or whatever else. You know, I used to lie in bed in the morning thinking, right, what meetings have I got? Am I going to be photographed today? Will they want to put their lens inside my suit pocket to see if I'm wearing an M&S suit? Yes, they probably would. Right, make sure you've got something M&S on. Or you know, am I doing things, you know, am I going to the wrong parties and being seen with the wrong sort of people? You know, you know it, you, very important. Do I look as if I would come out of some nightclub at three o'clock in the morning, three quarters pissed, and I've got the results tomorrow morning? You know? Uh, and equally, then, the behaviour of the business. Is the, be the business behaving? We've seen the whole issue about tax. You know, chief executives these days have to be, they have to be really, really, really good in terms of the things they have to be able to tackle. Any business worth its salt has got a treasury department and a tax department who's minimising the tax spend just in the same way as it is our perf right and responsibility as, perf as, as private individuals to pay the minimum amount of tax. So when does tax avoidance become you know, tax minimum minimisation? So we've got to talk about tax. You've got to talk about the human rights. You've, I mean, look at the issues that we've got to talk about, um, about uh, sustainability, fair wage, living wage, all the rest of it. You've got to talk about sourcing. Look at this terrible thing that's happened in, in Bangladesh. You know, the world today is such a small place and, you know, tentacles are so long that you've got to absolutely have your eyes and ears and antennae tuned to everything. But you have to be able to, I suppose, the, the one mantra that I used to try and live by is that you should be able to go home every night, look yourself in the mirror and say that you've, first of all, you've done the right thing. Doesn't mean you'll always get it right, but you've done the right thing and that you've been tru truthful to what the brand stands for and you've been true to yourself. It's not always easy, but you have to do it. Do you think, Sir Stuart, that um, Starbucks was right in giving £5 million despite the fact that it, it didn't owe that money? I, I thought, I, personally, I wouldn't have done it. And I think that, you know, actually, the time's moved on since then now because mm. I think, you know, I don't know enough about their particular tax arrangements and their transfer pricing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, I thought it was a bit insulting, mm. frankly. And I think it may have done them less good than, not, than good in terms of if you did a straw poll today about what people think about Starbucks. My guess is that people hold Starbucks in less high esteem than they might have held it six months ago. That's my guess. I may be completely wrong. People now are very... Uh, this whole issue about trust... People are that smarter than you think. So I always get understand. Somebody's going to start a politician's party soon called the Plain Speaking Party. Tackling issues if you explain to people why you're doing things. When I was at m and we closed the um, pension fund for new entrants and it was, con it was um, a non-contributory pension fund. It was a very nice fund. But then after that, I had to go back to the staff, all 100,000 of them, and say, actually, look, I made a mistake things have overtaken us, that where, where before those of you, some of you were in it on a non-contributory basis, actually now I'm going to have to ask those of you to make a contribution as well, and it's going to go up, I think it was 2% the first year, 3% the following year, and 6% after five years or something. And we explained why, that we were taking out more than we were putting mm -hmm. in, da 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 that, 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 that the investments on pension funds were underperforming, blah, 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 and we told the truth, and what did we get? Pretty well 100% acceptance. Because we told them what the problem was. Tell the truth. <coughs> Be honest. Don't lie. Never lie. It's the same in crisis management, isn't it? If you say there's a crisis, then it resolves the problem to some extent. You can't just fob people off. You've just got to be honest with them and tell them the situation. Right? Yeah. Uh, gentleman here. Hi, Stuart. John Leary Joyce, Academy of Executive Coaching. Uh, my business is about coaching, so I want to ask you, <laughs> uh, what do you think about coaching, executive coaching? Have you had a coach? 
Do you believe in it, um, your policy in m &S? Well, The answer is I do believe in executive coaching. I think that you can't offer it to everybody, but I mean, we used to run several schemes. I mean, going back to my, my youth, we didn't have coaching at m and but what we did have uh, at one point in time was mentoring internally, where you know, there was somebody you could go to and have a chat to about, not your career so much, just about, you know, about your fears and concerns, although, you know, necessarily, and you'll understand this better than most, um, you know, there was always a bit of reluctance to say actually what you really thought, because it doesn't matter how independent, you're, he was still your boss or somebody else's boss. So, uh, but he worked to an extent with me. Um, I believe that people can be helped, whether it's helping with, it, with media skills, whether it's, I mean, this goes back to the comment this lady here. We're now required to be good on TV, to be good on radio, to be good with the media, to be good with our staff, to be able to make a presentation, to be able to make a speech, and do all the rest of it. Well, how the hell are we supposed to learn all this stuff? I learned the hard way. And I've had more sleepless nights, more palpitations, and you know, more pains in my ass than I care to admit to. But, <laughs> but, but you know, I think we should do it. And, uh, you know, and there are some great firms out there who do it well. I've sent loads of people for, for. Thank you for that question. Hi, Jonathan Pilbara from DHL. If you looked at the high street in five years, what, what do you think you'll see? Well, I sit on the board of a property company, Land Securities, which has got a third of its assets uh, in bricks and mortar, and they ask me the same question every time we have a board meeting, and I said, I knew the answer, guys. <laughs> um, but the answer is, I, you know, retailing has been, as you said, slightly cheekily, the second oldest profession in the world. You know, it's been on the banks of the Niles for 5,000 years, people selling carpets and peanuts and whatever they sell. So it's not going to disappear. Uh, and there will still be bricks and mortar shops, but what we are going to see is a lot of different sort of trends and polarizations. I think what we have seen is, first of all, you know, there are demographic changes which we cannot help. The second thing, the trend that we've seen is that there's convenience. Convenience, people want to go. So whether it's petrol prices, whether it's the fact we want more fresh food, or more local shopping, or more interaction, or whatever else. I mean, you know, look what's happening with Tesco's, T Tesco metros, local Safeways, Marks and Spencer, Simply Foods, and whatever else. That is the norm now. People want those sorts of things, daily top up and whatever else. We've seen the fact that people want big destination shops. So they want that as well. We've seen the big rise of click and collect there. We've seen the big rise of internet. We've seen the fact that in M&S, the biggest thing that happened was that somebody would come in, they might want to buy a sofa, they'd sit on it, they'd do this, they'd go that, they'd take the catalog home, then they might order it online, then they might have it de not delivered to the home address but to a different address, so they want everything every which way. So we've got to be able to cope for that. But do I believe that, you know, take Marx's case, in Marks & Spencer where there's a store in Western Supermare, which has been going for 104 years, that that store will disappear? No, because there are three or 400,000 people in the catchment area. There's a need to go there. What will happen is, though, is it will change. So at the moment, it's got a perfectly adequate food section and it's got a perfectly inadequate clothing section, by which I mean you can only get a part, small part of the range. What I suspect will happen is they will have a fantastic food section and they'll have home delivery at some point. But the textile section will probably shrink. It will have your tights and your knickers and your men's underpants and your socks, the stuff you need today. But what it will have is the technology in place to say that if you order it by 7 o'clock tonight by touch this or that or by phone, this will be delivered to the store for you to pick up tomorrow from our whole catalogue. And at the same time, you may have done a deal with Amazon to have a click and collect centre there or a deal with Ocado or a deal with somebody else. So the place will become more of a sort of social place, less of a sort of, you know, something and nothing now. You know, it's too light for heavy work in both cases. But I don't think it'll disappear. Um, the, the one, so, and, and also, people want to go for the day out, but there's a limit in planning regulations in the UK to how many um, blue waters there are going to be and how many uh, meadow halls and whatever else. I think there's another factor, though, and that is that it's in, within our own um, control, the, whether it's property companies, whether it's the debate, which is probably fair mm -hmm. about rates, whether it's fair about local government and whatever else. We've got to invest in these places. And if you create new and exciting places, and if you haven't been, go and look at Leeds Trinity, which is in the centre of Leeds, which used to be right in the centre of Leeds, great city now, Leeds doing, doing well again despite the recession, lots of in, in, inward investment. But the city centre area of that shopping centre was dreadful, right? Land Securities, actually, it's a bit of an advert for Land Securities, spent five years and two or three hundred million quid and put it together. It's going gangbusters. 
The people want to go to new and exciting places. And I was giving a talk the other day about the fact, you know, it's about shopping centres. Well, people say the shopping centre is great. Well, actually, shopping centres are great only when you get into the bloody things, because the experience of getting to half of them is you go down this bloody road you can't get into, you go through these narrow bits, the ticket machine doesn't bloody work, it smells of urine, the kids are screaming in the back of the car, Granny's having a bloody nervous breakdown, you want a bloody cup of coffee, is there a coffee bar down there? Is there a latrine down there? Is there somebody to give you valet parking down there? Is it expensive? Yes, too expensive. You're pissed off before you've even got into the shopping center. So if we were to think about some of those things to making life more fun, I think actually there is life in the high street, but not everyone. Uh, Chris Jackson from the EMCC. A question on innovation. So M&S is uh, touted as one of the best examples of continuous innovation in the last hundred years. Where does it come from? People, structure, and how do you sustain it? It comes from the culture of the business and then the people in that <coughs> culture to make it happen. But, you know, M&S, it's been in the genes. The gentleman talked about genes earlier on. Some of it is in the genes. It's in about... M&S, when I went... I said at the very beginning, I think, that no, I was lucky to go into M&S at the time, that it was really humming. And from the very chief executive, or the chairman at that time, right the way through the business, we used to go into work on a Monday morning and we used to be breaking all records every week, and we beat ourselves senseless. This wasn't good enough. We could have sold more of that. We could have done this. This had too much sugar. That didn't have enough sugar. This was too salty. That was too expensive. We could have done this. You think, oh, for God's sake, if you're a bit sensitive, you shouldn't have been there, right? But what it, dreamt, it, it bred was this competitive thing. The guys in the meat department wanted to do better than the guys in the fish department. The guys in the fish department wanted to do better than the guys in the banana department. The banana department wanted to do better than the knicker department. So, you know, it was all sort of, you know, it was all sort of self-propagating. And that came from the culture and the leadership. But it really, really came, I suppose, from one man who set the sort of thing rolling, and that was Simon Marks. You know, I was unfashionably chairman and chief executive of MS for two years. He was uh, very fashionably at the time chairman and chief executive for 46 years. You know, he was a tyrant. He was a genius. He was, you know, charismatic. He was irritating, you know, and he died whilst bollocking a blouse buyer after lunch in Baker Street. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but presumably he was happy, right? <laughs> and he built that business and, it took a, and they still haven't killed it. In the, the business is still a very innovative business. <laughs> he did, so he died on it. He went, went to lunch and shouted at the blouse bar and dropped dead. <laughs> I won't tell you what he said, it's too rude, but... Yeah. <laughs> so, so, did you and Sir Philip Green always have a fight at one point outside Baker Street talking about... We did have a little physical um, meeting, yes. Did you? <laughs> Listen, it's no, it's, no, it's no... There are lots of bits about the beard which were not so pleasant. At the end of the day, I think the right answer came out because if Philip had offered up had offered enough money and we live in a free uh, market world, then the shareholders would have accepted it. They didn't accept it, so the rest is history. Yeah. But there were some pretty nasty moments and, you know, mm. I've been followed around town day and night by, by people, being accosted when you're not expecting it to, having your car tampered with, having your mail tampered with, having your, all your telephone numbers downloaded for the preceding six months and every single person who you had rung or had a phone call being rung up to check who it was from and what it was from. And I'm not saying any of that was connected to, to, the, uh, to, to the deal, of course. Um, it's a pretty unpleasant experience. Yeah. But, you know, but it's love-hate because you had a birthday party with him not long ago. Uh, it was quite a long time ago, actually. Okay. It was four and a half years ago. But, <laughs> but yes. Well, Listen, life's too short. <laughs> Get on with it. Have some fun. Work can be really fun. And strictly in board meetings, people say to me sometimes when I use the word fun, as if you're being irreverent, as if you're, being not, if you're not being serious. Why can't you have a joke? If you want to have a really good laugh in a board meeting, you know, invite yourself to the Ocado board meetings, you know? <laughs> but we do some very serious business. So you can have fun and be serious. That offer is not open to Tesco, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if we could just uh, now um, thank Sir Stuart Rose for his time today and all the great wisdom he shared with us. Sir Stuart, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.